Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Dasher. I direct US Asia Technology Management Center. And uh, we're very happy to be continuing our series of Stanford classes and public seminars. They serve both purposes on the topic of entrepreneurship and Asian high-tech industries. Today, I'm delighted to be able to introduce one of the people who has a really unusual perspective into uh, this topic in Japan. Among other things, he was Japan's first per professional podcaster. So uh, Tim Romero uh, got his undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Virginia, but then became a professional musician. And the first time he went to Japan was under a contract with a Japanese music company, which canceled his contract within a month. So he started doing other things. He went to Los Angeles and started doing software development and uh, wound up working for a Japanese company in Los Angeles that sent him back to Japan to do software development for the company. And along about 1999, he uh, started his own company uh, that he sold to Digital Garage within a year. And from then, really 1999 until I would say now, Tim has been a serial entrepreneur in Japan. He's done various projects. To, he's created uh, several different companies. He's also worked for large companies on occasion. He was in charge of software development for Zurich Financial. Um, he also had the experience of bringing a Silicon Valley startup into Japan. He uh, started his podcast, which has the wonderful title, Disrupting Japan, in 2014, and um, taught innovation and entrepreneurship at New York University's Tokyo campus. He helped Japan's largest power company, TEPCO, create an innovation group and since 2020, he's been the head of uh, Google for Startups in Tokyo. So uh, Tim, welcome today. I want to um, ask if you mind saying what you're doing in your day job for uh, Google for Startups, just to get things started. Sure, and, and thanks for that, that, that introduction. I mean, it, it sounds like a... a crazy and chaotic career when you compress, you know, 40 years into, um, <laughs> into 30 seconds or so, but, uh, it, it's, uh, but yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about Google. So Google for startups is, uh, Google's outreach into the startup community. Um, it's supporting Japanese startups, trying to develop the com community across the board. Uh, we run accelerators and program and uh, growth academies, but they're they're non-equity. We don't uh, make investments. We don't charge. It's stri strictly to support the the ecosystem. Okay, and you're still doing disrupting Japan, right? Oh, very much so. Uh, I've had to to slow it down a bit, so I'm I'm doing one episode a month. Uh, I wish I had more time to put into it. People always ask, there, there's still this idea that there's not a lot of innovation in Japan. And, and the most common question I get asked is, well, how do you keep finding these startups? And I, I could do three shows a week if I had, if I had the time. It's, it's amazing what's going on in Japan right now. Meanwhile, I have a suspicion that people like Forbes Japan are watching your show to figure out who they're gonna feature in the next month. <laughs> You really it's, have had a wonderful set of people on. Tell us a little bit about some of your favorite episodes. I, you know, I, I don't really have a favorite, or I, I guess you say all the episodes are my favorite. I, I've never released an episode that is not my favorite. Um, I, I, I can't yeah, say. Okay. No, I, honestly, that's fine. Everyone, everyone it, it, there's this difference between like sometimes I will. Um, think an episode is fantastic and insightful and, and is going to do well. And it's received kind of, um, you know, average. And sometimes I'll work on something and I'm not happy with it and question whether I should put it out. And then it turns out to be this, this huge success. So I I've given up trying to predict which ones are, are good or bad. I just try to make everyone the best I can and put it out there. Okay. 
So Tim, you've had an awful lot of experience on both sides of the fence, the big company fence and the startup side in Japan. And uh, I think that we both agree that this is an interesting and kind of timely topic today. I was really happy to have our discussion a while, you know, a few weeks ago to make sure that we're on the same page. What, from your perspective, let's start on the startup side. In your experience, what kind of things have been distinctive about the startup experience in Japan? Um, I, I think that th there's really almost two generations of, of startups. So I think if you're looking about 10 years ago, there was a real shift in attitudes. So during the dot-com era, there was not really a startup community. Uh, there wasn't an ecosystem. I mean, the, we founders knew each other, but it wasn't a community. Um, now there's a genuine startup ecosystem where before most startups had to either sell direct to consumer or they had to sell uh, to large enterprises and that was the only way to survive. But now there's a genuine ecosystem where startups are selling to each other um, where a bulk, uh, many startups, that's the bulk of their, their business. And the reason that's important is it allows new ideas to enter the ecosystem much faster. Um, you can get these uh, test cases, use cases, success stories. And then when you go to the large enterprises and say, oh, no, this is not new. This is, look at all these companies using it successfully. It's much easier for them to say, yeah, let's try that. And it allows innovation to happen much quicker. Uh, and I think that's the existence of that ecosystem is probably the 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 most significant along, difference I've seen. Along about when do you think the ecosystem really started to form? Uh, I'd say in the last ten years. I, I'd say like ten years ago okay. we started to see the beginnings of it. The first startups that really focused on serving other startups were um, probably recruiting companies. Um, some very small, like agile software development companies who were, were focused on, you know, different ways of doing things. But after that, after the ecosystem got big enough, um, it, it's, it's become, I mean, much smaller than the U.S., but very similar dynamic where it, it is a market unto itself. So who are the major players? Um... That's, yeah, that's the thing. There aren't really, I mean, there are, they're the bigger startups, of course, which are. It's not like, it's not like Japan has this kind of virtuous center that people talk about in Silicon Valley, where you've got some VCs like A16Z and, and these companies that are really, you know, the gold standard than everybody else is kind of trying to be there. Well, I mean, I mean Tokyo, of course, is, uh, it's, 70% of the startups and I think like 80% of the VC money gets invested in Tokyo. So it is without yeah. question the center. Yeah. But with, within that, there, um, I, I'd hesitate to say like this one company or this one VC is the leader. Um, and that's, okay. that's good. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of distinctive things about the startup experience, okay, and I'm, I'm you know, getting this out of your bio, you took Engine Yard, which was a cloud computing company from Silicon Valley into Japan and developed, you know, great results. You know, something like 9% of their revenue increase was due to Japan and 15% of their new customers were coming from Japan. And I told you you weren't growing fast enough and, made you, and shut down the office, right? Oh, well, no, they were, they were very happy with Japan. It was just a global okay. Um, you know, it's a Silicon Valley company. And if you're not doubling every year, you're losing out to another company who is. So just they made the decision, the new investors made the decision to kind of pivot the company a bit. So okay. completely rational decision on their part. Uh, it was a shame because it, it really worked in Japan. But, but, but Okay, it, it works in Japan, but yet that's not 100% a year growth. No. <laughs> um, so actually, it's a very interesting, that, that market entry was, it, it highlighted a really interesting point about the difference between startups in Japan and in Silicon Valley. Because uh, our, our, part of our core market was startups. 
And in Japan, in the US, the main selling point was um, this was a platform as a service company. So you can get to market faster. Your engineers can develop and test faster. Uh, you'll be more innovative. You'll, you'll outmaneuver your competitors. In Japan, that didn't sell as well. And uh, what, what did sell is we had this one feature, one, one product, a service offering that, that wasn't that popular in the U.S., but it was um, for an extra fee, we'll train an engineer on your system so that if your system goes down, they will try to fix it. You know, they will, they will take, do everything they can before they contact you to let you know it's down. And in Japan, that was huge um, because it's stability, it's reliability. And our pitch was like, look, we're going to make you look really good in front of your customers. You're, you'll never go down. You'll have this expertise from around the world. Hugely successful. So it, it was exactly the same product, but very different sensibilities and what was important in each market. I think that's interesting. It's also interesting in context of a labor force distinction that I'm aware of that on the US side, two thirds of all of the expert IT people are in what we would call client companies, the actual end user companies. Whereas in Japan, two thirds of all the IT expertise is either in the IT companies or in the systems integrators. That the individual companies, at least until relatively recently, really didn't have much IT expertise. No, and this is really important. And, and um, not to plug the show too much, but there's an episode with Sri uh, Ram Venkateraman, who we, we cover this in depth on, on Japan market entry and how J Japanese enterprise use their IT outsourcers as institutional knowledge. Um, they don't view it as contract. Uh, it's this long-term relationship. And that has... Um, that relationship has really slowed down innovation in Japan. Uh, and I, I think this is, uh, a lot of my recent episodes, I've been talking about SaaS software. And I, I think the reason SaaS software is really big in Japan right now is it allows large customers to kind of leapfrog a generation of technology and go around their, um, their systems integrators. And the most, com most common, when I talk to founders who are selling SaaS software, the most common thing they tell me from their clients is not that these big enterprises are particularly excited about using SaaS software. It's usually they've gone to their systems integrator and say, well, we want to do X. And the SI will say, okay, well, that's great. That's going to cost you $6 million. And 18 months. And 18 months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's before cost and budget, you know, before budget yeah. and time overruns. Uh, and then the SaaS company says, oh, well, we can do that for 500 bucks a month. Sounds like a pretty good deal. And, and we'll have it there within two months or three months. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you can start tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and and I, I think what really happened, um, I mean, Salesforce was the big one that, that, that kind of introduced the concept of, of enterprise SaaS. It allowed, it, it, it made it okay for Japan enterprise to outsource their, their IT like piecemeal. But really over the last seven, eight years, um, the, that, that firewall has come down and SaaS is really going into the enterprise and systems integrators are having a hard time with it. Um, so that's, I, a, that's also a, a relatively recent, pretty big change. Yeah, and, and, and I do think if you look at some of the most successful Japanese SaaS companies, they started their, their original customer base was with startups and freelancers. So like uh, Smart, Smart HR, uh, Free, all of these started not with enterprise sales, but with freelancers and other startups, and then they worked up to the enterprise. So the, okay. the classic, you know, uh, Clayton Christensen disruption model. Yep. So Tim, uh, before we go into kind of really the thing about big companies and startup companies, a couple of other things about the whole sort of startup ecosystem in Japan and the way it's viewed. To what extent do you think social stigma 
against going to work for a startup company as opposed to a name brand firm is still hindering the system? Um, when, when I, there was a, the first new hire, I mean, new graduate I ever hired for one of my companies was at Vanguard back in 1999. And at this point, uh, he was a graduate of Waseda. He was excited about joining the company. He was perfect for the company. And his mom would not let him join. And it wasn't so much that it was a foreign company or a small company. And so anyway, I had to go meet mom. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and it, it wasn't, a, it, it really, it wasn't that it was a foreigner or anything, but, but she just didn't understand the concept of a startup. Like, wait, you're getting the money from yeah. these people and then you're gonna go sell it for 10 times more to these other people. It sounded like some kind of a scam to her. Um, so I explained it. Uh, apparently I was convincing because she allowed her son to, to join our company. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and believe it or not, I think the biggest change in the consciousness was the movie, The Social Network. Um, that, that was the first time that most Japanese had ever heard of the concept of a startup. But so after- that movie hit Japan. Yeah, yeah. At, be, it, it's weird to say, but it wasn't any economic policy. I think it was that movie. So before yeah. that movie, I was constantly explaining what is a startup. No, it's not a scam. <laughs> After that movie, it was like, oh, you're running a startup. Okay. So socially, that, that, that was a real turning point. But I, I think le the legitimate, legitimizing startups, that, that took a longer time. Uh, but I think Japan's in a place now where it is normal and acceptable for uh, people to graduate from university and start a startup. We've got a lot of uh, startups, uh, new graduates from Todai, who normally were like fast-tracked into big companies and government who are starting startups. But there is, of course, still this pressure uh, in Japan because, you know, it, it traditionally it's not just you; it's your family, right? So. Your, your whole family's image depends, especially if you're a firstborn son, on you graduating and getting a good job so your parents can tell their extended family and their network that their son is now working at, at Mitsubishi or Mitsui. Uh, in, in fact, I've, I've actually been told by a number of, of women founders that it's actually easier for women to start a company because they don't feel that social pressure. Um, I hate to say it this way, but if you have been marginalized out of that kind of core elite workforce, maybe you don't care about them. Go I, do your I, thing. I think that's still very much so. And a, a number of my women founder friends have told me that they had conversations with their moms and their dads when they were starting it. And it was like, I have this great idea for a startup. And, and the parents are actually like, oh, well, that's that's nice, dear. You and your friends have fun with that for a few years. It's like, no, no, this is. And, and <laughs> so it, those social pressures are still very real here. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I think there's some of that everywhere. I think parents everywhere kind of want their children to have a good life. And, and there's I, I think parents everywhere would rather have their their kids go into a, a steady, safe job and career. Sure. I, I, you're giving me an idea for a very interesting statistical survey of what the percentage of entrepreneurs who are firstborn children as opposed to second and third born children are. Um, that would be fascinating. I would love to see the results of that in Japan. Yeah, if we could get a big enough sample. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and next thing I kind of ask about entrepreneur attitudes, and this is really kind of going to pick up Matt's question that has come in on chat. Uh, do you think that Japanese entrepreneurs still have kind of an old Japan first attitude or that do they have, are there more people with kind of a more global orientation from the very beginning? <laughs> I'm going to answer yes to both. Uh, it's still a problem. It, yeah. I, I think Japan, uh, entrepreneurs are getting a, a more and more global mindset, but nowhere near enough. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of things that, that result in, in Japanese founders focusing on Japan. Uh, the first and obvious is that the domestic market is huge. You can run a very successful company, IPO, without ever 
having a single sale outside Japan. And that's, that's not the case for almost any other country. Yeah. Um, the second is that there's a lot of pressure from the venture capital community to not go global. Um, the, the, traditionally, Japanese VCs have had, uh, the business model has relied on a steady stream of relatively safe, what the US could consider very low value IPOs. So they, they want to play it safe and, and going, going, doing a market entry requires a lot of capital. It's very high risk and it could put the IPO at risk. So the VCs all, will often pressure the founders like not to do it. Um, that, that is changing. There's been a number of founders who have very aggressively pushed back against that. There's a lot of foreign capital that is much less risk averse that is available to fast growing companies. So that's, that's changing as well. Uh, the Japanese VCs who are trying to stick to that old way of doing things are, are losing deal flow. And so they're, they're changing as well, but we're, we're not where we need to be there yet. I was gonna ask, do you think that if foreign VCs were willing to put in more of that late stage capital to help them expand, would the Japanese um, VCs see the light to a bigger IPO a little bit later? Or do they really still, do you think they would still prefer early and stable return? I think we'd see, I think we'd see a lot of growth in the segment of startups that have potential for international growth, which is by no means all of them. Um, I, the World Bank last year did a, a fantastic analysis of the, the, um, the Japan startup ecosystem. And one of the things that was most significant <clears throat> is the, the investment profile in seed investment versus middle versus late stage investment. And Japan was very, very heavily biased in favor of seed stage. So there is tremendous room for uh, both investment and growth in that middle. Yeah. And I, I think to get the global expansion is going to require a lot of investment in that middle or late stage. Yeah. So, so I, 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 think, I think it is going to come think from... the entrepreneurs could deal with it? Or do you have people who are afraid to speak English? Yeah, I, I, I don't think the... The English language is, is not as essential. It's not that essential, I think. I, I think if you look, for example, if you look at what Japan <clears throat> succeeded in, in like the 60s and 70s, they, they did it by where, where it was truly disruptive in, in across yeah. all kinds of industries. They, they did it by better products, better marketing, a better understanding of the consumer it certainly wasn't by English language ability or, or anything like that. So I, I, I think the ability to speak English is important, but the most important thing I think, so example, what, what those, the enterprises had in the, the 60s and 70s wasn't English language ability, but it was this intense obsession with what was happening in foreign markets. Um, you know, if, if there was a automaker in Central Africa experimenting with a new piston type, Toyota knew about it. Um, and, and I think that, that, that passion and drive to, to know the global market, to own the global market, that's, that's the key. And the English language skills will be helpful, but there's plenty of people with English language skills they can bring on board and, and help out. Okay, thank you. I want to make a brief comment and say, Kimberly, thank you for your comments in chat. Everyone can take a look at the comments. There were no questions there, uh, but welcome in today. Tom, we're going to get to your question in a little bit as we start to talk more about the big company startup company relationships. And that's kind of the next sort of major topic to get into is the big company point of view. So you've worked for large companies in the software space, and um, I'm sure that they were pitched by a lot of software-related startups. And I'm sure that there were a lot of SIRs who were trying to bring in things from startup companies. How does this look to the Japanese large companies now? Are they interested in startups? Oh yeah, I, I, I think, um... So Kay Donren just uh, last month, I believe, published their position paper, which is uh, 
um, quite unsurprisingly, in lockstep with the, the LDP's position paper on startups. And it was this full-throated endorsement of how we need to get uh, 10 trillion yen invested into it. The, the goal is to increase the number of startups and the number of unicorns by 10 times, the amount of startup investment by 10 times. I, I think Japanese industry has really realized the importance of startups for driving innovation forward. Uh, I think that a, another significant shift we've seen over the last 20 years is 20 years ago, strategic M&A just was not a thing in Japan. Um, M&A was something that it was distressed assets. If a company could yeah. buy customers or assets at fire sale prices, they would do it. Um, but strategic M&A just didn't happen. And now it's a thing. Um, a lot of big companies are developing M&A strategies. They're basing uh, both R&D and market expansion on, on, on uh, M&A domestically. Still new. There, there's a lot of bugs being worked out, but it's, it, it's a high priority for a lot of companies. So I, yeah, I, okay. I think but I got, I got to take what you said and kind of not exactly throw it back to you, but we need to fight on this one a little bit. Okay. Because, uh, okay, so the Japanese government has been preaching how important startup companies are for the last 20 years, at least. And you've got a lot of people who talk about the strategic importance of, you know, this kind of sector and this kind of innovation and so forth. But something on an individual level, when an individual uh, large company is talking to an individual startup company, seems to be kind of keeping the real benefits of the relationship from happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to disagree with the first half and agree with the second half. So disagree with the first half. Okay. Japan, the government has not been in favor of startups for 20 years at all. Um, Prime Minister There's Abe. A lot of money. Well, Prime Minister Abe represented a real shift. If you look at okay. like the, the, the 2000s, the, the government the politicians were constantly bashing NEETs and freelancers saying, you know, these lazy people who aren't getting jobs are the reason the economy is not growing. Uh, Abe was really the first one to come up and, and like say, publicly and on national TV, like startups are the future of Japan. This is what the, um, you know, innovation depends on these. And, and that spotlight meant a lot, I, I, I think. But getting back to the practical point, yeah, it, it is hard. Um, there are a, a lot of the, the big company startup integration and partnerships are it's it's baby steps. There are a lot of pilot projects, uh, a lot of proof of concepts that don't go beyond that and don't move into real business. And I think that's frustrating on both sides. Um, I, I think one of the biggest differences in Japan and the U.S. that that causes this is in in the U.S. at any large company, if you pick twenty staff members at random one or two probably has some startup experience, at, at least in big cities. In, in Japan, there isn't that flow between big companies and startups. Uh, I, I'm very unusual as someone who's moved back and forth between them. Um, more and more, we're yeah. seeing some big company people leave and go to startups, but, but there really needs to be this kind of revolving door where people go yeah. back and forth and that's, that's hard to do with Japan's current employment climate, where there just isn't, I mean, culturally, people just don't change jobs that often. So it is hard. There, there's a big gap between the way enterprises do business and startups do business. So uh, in this regard, are you seeing a lot of startup companies that their founders did come from the big companies, or are you getting founders more sort of outside the, the, the big company range most of the time? Most of the time, it's still from outside the big companies, but more and more, um, for example, Mitsui has a pretty much like a startup founder alumni, um, but that, that's kind of what you would expect from Mitsui. They're that trading company. They have that, that deal making in their DNA. Um, speaking of DNA, uh, you know, they just launched 
a year and a half, two years ago now, the Delight Ventures, where they're focusing on supporting these intrapreneurs to, to get them. If to there's work. anybody here who doesn't know DNA, it was a major gaming platform and game development company in Japan, one of their real high flyers. And so the founder really basically decided to take company money and start a, a venture capital fund just a year or two ago. Yeah. And, and to their credit, they are not trying to control these companies. They, they want to fund them. They want to make sure they have a minority stake um, and that the, the founders will go and, and won't be dependent on DNA. They won't, the DNA board won't try, DNA won't try to control the board. Uh, it, it's really an enlightened way of, of thinking. And yeah, these are all steps in the right direction. But, but there is... Kind of, yeah. yeah, there's one other thing that occurs to me we should talk about in terms of startup companies. Has the demographic of founders become younger? Because at one point, Japan had more kind of senior people who sort of were spun out into startups. Are you still seeing both groups? I, I haven't seen numbers on this, but I, I would assume that um, the demographics have shifted to be much younger just because, you know, 20 years ago, it was, it was almost impossible and quite frankly foolish for a new grad to go out and start a, start a company. Um, so I, I, I think there, there's almost a whole new type of startup that began to emerge en masse 15 years ago or so. Um, certainly once cloud computing became a reality and the costs of, of launching a software startup dropped, then we saw a lot more um, low capital, younger startups come onto the scene. But I, I haven't seen numbers, but I would assume, yeah, there's a lot, a lot more okay. young people starting. Because actually that too has kind of an issue because it's hard for different ages to really interact with each other in any kind of an uh, sort of peer situation, I won't say equality, but peer to peer, when the decision makers in the large companies probably had years of experience and, you know, work their way up through the ranks. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the, um, one of the founders who went through uh, one of our programs at Google, one of their big challenges was he was late 20s, uh, I guess he's early 30s now, but he was managing people who were in their 40s and 50s. And just neither side was, they were comfortable with the concept, but it, it took some sitting down and developing kind of this protocol of, of how that would work and, and how it's still respectful. And, and, and I think that's a, an issue a lot of young founders are facing. Okay. So we're getting all kinds of great comments in the chat. I want to say it's great to see my good friend, Dr. Gerhard Fossil who is also in Tokyo joining us today. Um, Michelle, oh, you. your comment is a great comment. Let me suggest that what we'll do, um, Tim, if you've got a few minutes at the end of the program, we'll turn off the recording and have an off the record discussion in which people can actually speak out and we can do much more gallery view instead of having the spotlight and that kind of thing. So uh, if you can stick around, we'll come back to your point about two different types of cultures um, a little bit later. Um, I think that one of the things that I'm curious about is that one of the things not really known that much about Silicon Valley is how important the big companies are to the ecosystem here because they are always looking at the startup companies. They invest in the startup companies, they get uh, proof of concept demonstrations from the startup companies because they're desperately afraid of becoming isolated in a very rapidly moving environment. This kind of open innovation is really the key to how the big companies interact with startup companies here. Uh, do you think that large companies in Japan have developed this kind of time intensive um, innovation focus to the way they want to interact with startups or do they have other goals? I don't think they do. I, I don't think Japanese enterprise view it that way. In fact, I, I think the reason, and to an extent, they, they're 
they're right. Brand, brands are more important in Japan than they are in the U.S. Um, it, it, so the, yeah. the enterprises do have a lot more market power in Japan than the comparable companies in the U.S. But I, I don't think that Japanese enterprise as a whole view startups as a threat. I, I don't think there's a sense that they will be disrupted by startups. I, I think the reason we're seeing this outpouring of support is that the enterprises are confident that they can co-opt the innovation, that, that they can partner <laughs> with these properties. They can control it. They can control it. I, I, I honestly think that's, from, from my discussions with, with people across the board, that, that seems to be the prevailing attitude. And there may be, I, I think it might be more controlled in Japan than it is in the U.S., but it's not going to be. Um, the, the metaphor I always use is is butterflies. If you if you introduce butterflies into a forest where there's never been any butterflies before, you don't have a forest plus butterflies. You have something different. Um, those butterflies are going to disturb the ecosystem. There's going to be plants they eat that are going to go away. There's going to be maybe things that feed on them that are going to thrive. It'll throw things out of balance and eventually it'll hit a new balance, but you can't predict what that balance is going to be in advance. It's very well said. Uh, and lack of prediction, predictability is not, not something that many large company people no. want to deal with, right? No, anywhere. So Elisa, who is a venture capitalist in Taiwan, welcome Elisa, has a couple of really great points. One is about the Japanese VCs have this domestic bias. Uh, do you think this has something to do with government funding and what is the role of government, central and local, in the uh, ecosystem in Japan? Um, I, I think the... I think all VCs have kind of a domestic bias. Um, in fact, I, I think, you know, US VCs had a very strong domestic bias until pretty recently. So I, th I think there is that. Um, I, I do think Jap Japanese VCs for the, the size of the company they're investing in definitely need to have more global perspective. Um, that's not a controversial statement. Everyone in Japan kind of agrees with it, but, you know, there's no obvious solution to it. Um, in terms of the roles the government can play, I, I think there's been a few things like the, the governments have streamlined visa processes, they've introduced new visa types to allow uh, foreign entrepreneurs to come to Japan. They've made incorporating so much easier than it used to be. Uh, they've streamlined some bankruptcy laws to reduce the risk. All of these are great things. Um, but I think the most important role that governments have done is uh, what I've referred to before is that spotlight. Yeah. So when, when the prime minister gets on national TV and says startups are important for the future of Japan, the next morning, the CEO of every major corporation is saying, you know, what are these startup things and why aren't we working with them? Um, the, the changes, a lot, of, a lot of governments have been working on changing their procurement policies to allow them to buy from newer companies and startups. And that is huge and legitimizing as well. The investment funds are, are hit and miss, the government funds. Um, the, yeah, I, I hesitate to make bl bl blanket statements because there are just so many different types. But when they work well, they it, it's also that form of legitimizing. Um, so it, it's the follow-on investments, it's the partners they bring in, it's the implied um, partnerships that come with it are much more valuable than the actual funds they provide. But, but I think the government plays the most productive role when it is um, being helpful rather than leading. You know, it's, it's showing a spotlight. It's, it's highlighting it. It's saying, hey, this is good for society rather than trying to get out in front and say, we want to develop um, this type of company in this specific geographical area, that, that's always a tough, tough sell. Okay. If I can just add really briefly, the role of government funds in Japan is not nearly as big as it is in China. And mm -hmm. you do have uh, government money that is put into the form of basically venture capital funds 
some of which are incredibly diverse. Uh, right now, they used to go by INCJ, Innovation Network Corporation of Japan. Now they're Japan Investment Corporation, JIC. Um, and so they're players, but they do everything from giant bailouts of airlines to real honest to goodness venture capital investment. Um, there's also Development Bank of Japan, which is kind of, you know, the Japanese title literally means the Policy Strategic Investment Corporation, basically. Um, but government is not so much of an LP in any of the venture capitalists. In uh, contrast, and Elisa mentions this in her comment, corporate venture capital is a big deal in Japan. And this is kind of a special category of things um, that is not, you know, not business relationships between companies, large and small companies, but investment relationships. Tim, would you comment a little bit about how CVC is in Japan? Uh, the, yeah, uh, and it's fascinating. So Actually, before I jump into the CVC, I do want to... Yeah. It's one more way that government investment is really important. Uh, and I've been saying one of the most important things Japan could do would be to create a J Japan version of DARPA. So uh, DARPA has been responsible for so much innovation in, in the United States over the last 30, 40 years. In many ways, they, they built Silicon Valley. Um, now, Japan, their version of DARPA obviously wouldn't be defense oriented, but the whole idea of saying, here's a problem, defining the problem, here's what we're looking to solve it, and then letting everyone from two university students in a garage to Toshiba to NEC compete to solve it is an incredible driver of innovation. So I think that'd be one of the most, one of the most beneficial things the Japanese government could spend its money on. Okay, Tim, you opened but, the door on that one. Now, okay. <laughs> um, the closest thing I think is probably the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NEDO, which is under um, METI, right? The yeah. industry ministry. And they're not nearly the size of DARPA, but they also don't have to spend money developing, you know, secret defense stuff either. That is true. I mean, I think the spirit is definitely the same, um, but it, it is... It, I think Neto is still run with more of. The, I am curious what's different. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really I, my question. I, I don't want to speak because I haven't worked with that team much at okay. all. Okay. It, it seems to me it's still as much more directive than yeah. kind of the, the black box. Here's the problem. You come up with the solution. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the handoff here. I think that's a very good point. Um, but to CVCs, I, I think CVCs have a extremely, they're playing a much more important role in Japan than they are in the US. And there's different types of, of CVCs in Japan. So there are um, CVCs that are really run like funds. Uh, Ito2 Ventures is, is one. Um, they're, they're run primarily to make a profit. They, they you know, there's, there's a fund carve out from them there's also, and, and they tend to be more, they tend to be older. Um, there's also a lot of companies that are newer to it that invest off the balance sheet. So they don't specifically have a fund. Um, and those, those companies, there's a lot of different reasons they'll do it. Uh, some are doing it for um, like market intelligence. They want to keep an eye on emerging trends. Some are doing it to, to, as kind of a, a the first steps towards a strategic M and A strategy, uh, a lot of them, I, I think, have very mixed objectives. Where um, it, it's not that they don't know why they're doing it; it's almost they have too many reasons they're doing it. So there's a lot of of um, it, it's hard to see what the mission is, but I, I think that the in, the the key role most of these funds play is introducing the the setting the stage for partnerships between the startups and the larger companies 
So whether those are R&D partnerships, whether those are um, actually going to market with a new product, a lot of it will start with these CVC funds. And, and interestingly, a lot of Japanese CVCs don't do follow-on investments. They'll, really? yeah, I know. I, it, cause that's where you make all the money. Um, but no, no, they, they just strategically, they want to get in the door. They want to have that uh, information. They want those connections. And a lot of them aren't, aren't primarily interested in the financial returns. Okay. Uh, so if they're not interested in the financial returns then they must have more interest in the strategic returns. And here we get back into the business relationships and the innovation relationships between the uh, big companies and the small companies. So before we go back into kind of all the problems there, are there any really good examples you would, you would like to bring out of successful kind of partnerships between big firms and, and startups in Japan? This is, this is, I think, is Robert's question, which is great. Yeah, I, I think um, so big and small, like uh, KDDI is, is one that, that does CVC extremely well. I mean- Okay, I'll, KDDI I'll, is one of the phone companies in Japan. Yeah, traditionally they were the international phone companies before all the deregulation, um, and I'll they'll stand up in quality to any corporate venture capital in the world. Um, so their acquisition, their investment and in acquisition of Soracom, uh, I guess about four or five years ago now, I, I think is probably one of the most successful investments and acquisitions that we've seen recently. On a smaller scale. Uh, yeah, let's run to the other end. I, I think there was, um, uh, I forgot the name of the startup, but they did a, a they got investment from uh, Casio to develop this little mapping, um, like a, a mapping GPS for a, a wearable. Mm -hmm. And they've done, it's, it's still very small, but the Last time I checked in, it was still like 50% annual growth of this new product line. So the startup company was funded by Casio, right? Venture Capital. Um, and then the business is the startups. Is Casio getting anything besides increase in stock value or do they have a, a contract in this? Uh, I haven't checked back with, these comp with the company for a couple of years, but it was, they were, um, it was a licensing agreement. So- uh -huh. Okay. They, the, this new product line was done like jointly. The software development was was being provided on contract from the software company. Mm -hmm. um, there also have been companies like I think L Pixel is an interesting one, uh, yeah. where there it's it's uh, AI uh, analysis of medical images uh, of MRIs, and their investment and in go to market is all through. Uh, uh, let's see, it's Mitsubishi and Hitachi, the major uh, equipment manufacturers. And their entire, they don't have any direct, um, I don't want to say direct, they don't own the customer per se. So they, they don't have the relationships with the hospitals and the doctors, and they're fine with that. And that, as an American entrepreneur, would make me incredibly nervous. <laughs> but in Japan, they're selling through the, the big companies. Yeah. yeah. And, but that, that kind of a partnership where they've got a little bit of corporate investment, they've got, um, you know, R&D that's going, you know, hand in hand is, is a model that's working in Japan. I think um, uh, preferred networks is perhaps the biggest example of that, uh, where almost all of their business is this joint um, development project. So they, they've, you know, outgrown yeah. corporate uh, uh, is corporate venture capital at this point, but most of their investments came with these kind of partnerships. Just so everybody knows, Preferred Networks was the first unicorn in Japan. I think they've gone public, haven't they? If I'm not they're not, sure. they're still yeah. a unicorn. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think they have. I think they're still they're, they're still a unicorn. Yeah. yeah, hold on a minute. We have a question from here in the uh, room. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about the Google for startups um, that we were talking about very briefly at the beginning, because you mentioned that, that you don't take an equity stake, and I believe that you said that you don't charge them. And so I'm curious, what does what is Google doing for startups? 
So the question is about Google for startups and the business model is that you're not taking equity and you're not charging a fee, right? I believe, I believe that's what you said. Was that what you said or, or you know, uh, in, in any case, what's Google doing for the startups is the question. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not here to talk about Google today. We're going to just talk about the ecosystem, but no, it, it is correct. We don't, um, Google for startups, the, the, our accelerator, our programs, we're not, taking equity, we're not charging startups. We're Google benefits when there is a healthy ecosystem. Um, I think everyone benefits when there's a healthy ecosystem. So the argument is uh, in, behind open innovation is that partnering with a startup company, getting knowledge from outside your company and bringing it in strengthens your innovation pipeline and probably accelerates innovation. Any um, companies that have really kind of done that in Japan on the big company side? So L Pixel is doing great, and and the you know the the major Japanese electronics companies are getting money from them, right? They're reselling. But what yeah. about accelerating innovation? You know, it's it's a really good question. I mean, I can point to a lot of kind of proof of concept stage things like preferred uh -huh. networks. Um, but I, I think before, yeah, not off, off the top of my head, I can't. I, I, I think that um, perhaps much like in the US, if a company is going to commit that heavily to a new, um, a new strategic direction, they'd want to buy the company. Whereas um, L Pixel or uh, the mapping company, it's, it's, if a, if a company wants to launch a new product line, it's a lower risk type of a thing. So off the top of my head, I can't think of any of these partnerships that, that propelled R&D forward in a significant way. Okay. I, I think there might be more in um, like the university collaborations on that, but okay. that's, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, no, that's a, that's a great answer. On the structural side, Japanese companies typically have very carefully designed business processes, right? Including formalized uh, consensus uh, approvals and this kind of thing. Um, structurally, do you think that uh, it's really difficult for, depending on your point of view, from the big company side, is it hard to work with the startup companies because they have kind of half-baked uh, business processes. And on the other hand, if you're a startup company, how do you deal with the kind of different conceptualization of time? You know, it, it's not, uh, I, I used to be an advisor for a company called Crew here in Japan. And they run, um, they've run 200, almost 300 corporate accelerators and corporate matching programs in Japan. And the reason it's been successful is before they start a program, they have, two and a half weeks of orientation for the large company saying, this is how you work with startups. This is what to expect. Um, and, and they, they bridge that, that impedance mismatch. So yeah, it is a problem. Just that they're the cultural differences, particularly with the large companies. Um, but there's an understanding on both sides that that's happening. When I was working uh, at Tepco Ventures, we saw it all the time. But most of the large companies, they, they understand this. They want to take steps to, to smooth it out. And in, in generally, it's, it's not that big a problem. The, the larger problem in, in enterprise sales for startups or enterprise collaboration is the... Um, I was going to say the decision-making process, but that's too, too vague. Um, it is, is the, the large number of people that need to be involved with any one decision. Yeah. And the fact that those people will almost never be able to be in the same room at one time. So yeah. the large companies that have been, you know, reasonably successful at it. And for example, what TEPCO did is they just carved out a, a separate entity said, okay, you guys are TEPCO Ventures. You make the decisions and bring them back to us. 
And then this small group, they're, um, I mean, 80% of my job when I was at TEPCO was selling inside TEPCO about, no, no, this is important. This is why you need to pay attention to this innovation. This is how it can help you. Um, and that model seems to work pretty well. So actually, it seems to be a model that's increasingly common too. Absolutely. I'm seeing a lot of these innovation groups and being given more and more independence like that. Uh, would you say that's a change kind of happening? And what do you see as the kind of, is it gonna, is it already having any results? I, I think it is. I, I think a lot of it is just, um, so I mean, there have been CVC firms in Japan for a long time, but there, the, there's a lot yeah, more but companies I'm, I'm really with it now. Bro, you know, more broadly innovation groups, not yeah, just CVC, I, I think, what a lot of Japanese I, I think, companies call corporate venturing, right? Right. So I, I think what we're seeing now is just there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of people trying to figure out what works. Um, and this model of like empowering a relatively small group of people to to go out and make that happen is one of the, the more workable models. So we're seeing more of it. OK, but, uh, you know, then I almost suspect that the barrier becomes not so much between the startup and the big company, but between the innovation group and the big company and the existing business units of the big company. Yeah, but that's a much easier barrier to, to bridge. Um, if, if you've got uh, people, you know, relatively senior people represented in that small group, um, then it, it can work. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did a TEPCO all the time is, is anytime we had this new innovative idea or concept we want to introduce, it'd be like, okay, who's going to support it? Who's going to oppose it? Who can we, I mean, it's, but that's, that can't be the startup's job. That, that has to be something that's done internally. And if a large corporation makes a conscious decision that we're going to set up a team with these objectives, it, it's really workable. Um, one thing that, that hasn't worked uh, another large company I, I've uh, done some consulting with has an innovation program that they've, and it's a great program. They've invested in it heavily. They've gotten some wonderful startups. They, they have gotten some pilot projects out of it. But one of the things they did at the, the end when they were trying to figure out how to make these connections is they had the list of the, the top 10. And then they would circulate that among all of the senior buchos and the, the division chiefs within the company. And they would say, yes, I can work with these guys. Yeah, I want to work with these guys. And the problem is that the really innovative solutions aren't, you know, they won't fit in under any one person's domain. Yeah. Right? So what they ended up Especially getting- Especially if, if they might disrupt the structure. Exactly. And so even, so a lot of the, the, um, the feedback was kind of like, oh, these, these guys are interesting for someone in our company should be working with these guys, but not me. And so I was trying to get them to say like, look, just change the feedback and we'll add this, this other ranking for someone should be working with these guys, but not me. And those are the guys you really need to work with. Uh, but I, I don't think they, they took my advice on that. So uh, I, um... You know, I'm curious how you see this situation changing. What do you think are the biggest changes recently? Because it really seems like the last 10 years have been have seen a lot of new things, <coughs> especially in big companies, um, startup company relationships. I think it's it is. Um... Everyone you may have mentioned question. them already. This is just no, no, but it, it just really as a perspective, thing. everyone likes to talk about the 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 big headline, the amount of money invested, and the large announcements and large programs. But I, I honestly think the most important thing has been the shift in attitude. Um, I, I think what's happened is startups are growing. Um, a lot of Japan's economy, most of Japan's economy, is not, and I think it is this very practical realization that growth and innovation is going to depend a large part on these startups. And it's no longer theoretical. Um, the startups are growing. They, they are going international. It, it is working. They are succeeding. And so there is 
a very practical desire to figure out how to work with it, how to work with these companies, how to, um, to learn what they know. And th there's a tremendous amount of churn and experimentation. And, and we tend to hear about the more successful, successful stories. And like the model I, I was explaining of like the small group who is tasked with not only finding the starters, but going back and fighting the fight internally, that's one model that works. Um, it, it's becoming more common. There might be others that, that prove more effective. So I think right now we're, we're certainly from the large company stage, we're in this, this stage of the commitment has been made, but there's an awful lot of experimentation going on. No, no one's figured out like how to do this right just yet. So it's, it's an exciting time. Okay. So there's a couple of questions that really take us back into the startup world. And I've been kind of ignoring them because we were talking about big company, small company relations. But Sasha asked two separate questions. One is about equity um, or stock options being uh, awarded to employees as part of the compensation package. What's going on with that? And the other is really growth stage uh, funding. If the startup companies in Japan are going to grow more, there's got to be money behind it. Where will it come from? So let's go with the equity question first. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not an expert in this. I, I do know there has been some tax reforms about how um, unvested options are taxed. Uh, I know that change was made a couple of years ago, but I don't, I don't know the details of that. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not the right I'm, guy to talk about. I mean, it, there's a lot of tax system differences. On yeah. the investor side, my understanding is that carry is withheld from Japan before the end of the fund. Again, I, I, I'm not yeah, an expert. In, in any case, yeah. on the employee side, it used to be illegal to give stock options to people. Now, this was 30 years ago. I remember one of the people I knew who was made the uh, CEO of an American company, a Japanese guy I knew, was given phantom stock option equivalents because stock options were illegal. Uh, that changed some time ago, but there's still kind of less of a sense, I think, on the part of a lot of founders that the people who go to work for them deserve a piece of the company. Do you see that changing? I, I do think that's changed. And there, there are, the, the stock options have gone through a couple of phases. There was a phase where they were just, it, it was almost, impossible to give them legally. There was a phase where they were being taxed as income, which is just totally unreasonable. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do think the, particularly younger founders, newer founders, the idea of granting equity is very normal and expected here now. Um, it's, not to the, it's not nearly to the degree that it is in the US. Um, there is, I think the U.S. is kind of an extreme. There's a lot of, particularly programmers will go from startup to startup, stay just long enough for the options to vest and then bounce to another company so that the options rather than the salary are, are seen as like the main thing. It, it's not like that here. So employee stock options tend to be a much smaller percentage, but they, they, they are common. They are, are being done. I don't think... Um, 20 years ago, yeah, it, it was an odd thing to give founder or non-founders equity, but now I think it is, it is normal. So this kind of suggests that um, once a startup is successful and goes public, somebody who's been, you know, moving stuff around in a warehouse is probably not going to be able to buy a multi-million dollar house with their uh, stock. No, but, but the first... 15, 20 hires quite probably will. Okay. Okay. That's great to see that kind of distribution. What about the growth capital? How do you see that uh, situation in Japan now? I think that's a, that's a stickier problem. And I'm not completely sure whether it is a, a supply or demand issue. So there is that's a great point now demand issue would be an entrepreneur or founder team 
wanting to take capital so that they can grow the company even bigger. But yeah. of course, the payoff is that they're selling stock that otherwise, it, you know, it dilutes their percentage. That's right. And so I, I'm not sure if how many startups there really are that could deploy $20 million for a global expansion with a reasonable chance of success uh, versus how, whether it is uh, the large companies who are hesitant to invest that level. I, I tend to think it's more on the supply side because there are a lot of very large funds that have Japan in their charter. Um, there are you know, a lot of funds in Japan that are raising you know, very large funds. And you know, if you've got a $200 million fund, you, you can't, that's not a seed fund. You, know, you have to write big checks. So I, I have no data to back it up, but just my gut feel is that it, it's right now, there's a shortage of, of startups that are really ready to take $20 million plus deployed intelligently and go global. Okay. So uh, we've got an interesting kind of comment slash question from Founder Institute in Tokyo, and it has to do with the uh, independence of board and ownership stake of the founders. One of the things that does happen in the growth of a startup here is basically you have to have a, you have to create a formal board structure and investors are going to be on your board and they're not all your friends. Hmm. Are you seeing that kind of uh, pattern developing in Japan where boards are exercising independent governance of later stage startups? No, not really. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I hesitate to paint with too broad a brush, but in general, um, Japanese VCs, corporate and financial, tend to be much more hands-off than um, the, their American counterpoint. Parts. I mean, they might be very demanding for documentation and reports, but in terms of like strategic direction, um, it, it's much more hands off. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is is tough to say. Okay, good point. Um, <laughs> what do you think going forward? What kind of things are are going to drive the startup ecosystem forward? What's the real driving thing that's it looks like it's starting to blossom to me too, but I'm curious what you think is behind this. Uh, well, I'll talk about like kind of short term and long term. I, I, I think short term, we're going to see a lot of um, B2B SaaS companies. Uh, I, I think that a lot of a lot of Japanese enterprises, their their IT is 20 years old. Um, and they haven't been able to afford to modernize, and this allows them to jump forward a, you know, a couple generations in tech right away. I, I think that's going to lead to not only a boom of startups, but a lot more efficient operation of large enterprises as well. Uh, it's going to be very tough on the, the traditional SIs, the system, traditional systems integrators. I think long term, Japan has got some unique opportunities in um, elder tech, in aging societies, because Japan is like Europe is facing the same demographics a decade from now that Japan has now and, and China maybe 20 years following it. So Japan has a chance to really you know, have a market to itself, develop something that truly can be transformative globally. And I think we're seeing some I, I wouldn't say products yet, but really interesting innovation in that, that intersection of artificial intelligence, robotics, and, and um, mach These human machine. Japanese machining. startups, right? Japanese startups, are, yeah. yeah okay. And really working on automation and robotics that make us feel comfortable working with them. Uh, and I think that's going to be essential for um, healthcare. Uh, to, to managing the healthcare of a large aging population, which all countries are facing, requires automation, but we can only get to automation if we are yeah. comfortable interacting with it. And so yeah. I, I, there's some fascinating things going on in Japan in that area, but nothing I can point to say, yes, this, this is the future. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the things that's 
motivating a lot of the Japanese kind of innovation groups in the Bay Area is to use startup companies here to try to help their companies solve the famous digital transformation problem. And I'm really curious what you think is, is that going to have an impact on the kind of startup ecosystem in Japan? Or does it basically, are they gonna be passed over because they're next door instead of 5,000 miles away? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think, I, I think that, and I don't think this is unique to Japan. I think it's true selling anywhere, your, your customer needs to believe you've got a commitment to them and to the market. Uh, but if your IT staff is in Vietnam or Silicon Valley or, you know, nobody really, nobody really cares. It's not an impediment anymore. Uh, I, I've had some really interesting conversations with um, the founders of Cloudian, for example, who, who sort of rebranded themselves as a Silicon Valley company rather than a Japanese company. So because so they, for they, everybody here, Cloudian does object-based storage. And they are a very successful Japanese startup that has completely gone global. Yep. But they felt there was a real negative perception about Japanese software companies. So they, they kind of re, not rebranded, um, but they present themselves as a Silicon Valley company. Although they say they're kind of opening that image up a bit and, and leaning into their Japanese identity a little more these days. Okay. So it might be changing, but from the startup point of view, when you're dealing with, I, I don't think it matters that much. I, I think what the, the SaaS is gonna be a big driver of digital innovation. Mm -hmm. the, the bottleneck hasn't really, I don't think has not so much been like <sighs> traditional thinking or, or culture. It's been economic, I, I think. It's just been the the systems integrator, the dependence on the systems integrator, outsourcing the institutional technology technological knowledge to another company, has made it too expensive for many Japanese enterprises to 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 go through a digital transformation. And now that startups have dropped that cost to a tenth, a hundredth of what they thought it was going to be, many companies are moving forward. COVID forced a lot of companies to rethink how they did business. Um, and that, that was quite a, quite a shock. I had talking with friends who some companies, or at least some divisions in some companies had honko days where they had big stacks of paper waiting for them and they'd have someone come in and stamp it every Thursday. Um, but all that's, all that's being rethought. So I'm, I'm optimistic. There, there's a long way to go, but I, I, I think the resistance really has been more economic than anything else. Do you think that Japan deserves a better reputation or is it really is kind of... It's pretty bad. Not uh, onto the <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it is, there is a lot of catching up to do. I, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of the image of, of Japanese enterprise being, having outdated IT is, is well-deserved. Um, but it is it is improving. Okay, I want to make sure that uh, students here in the classroom have a chance to ask questions. Anybody got a question? Back in the back. Um, thank you, uh, Jim, for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Rhythm. I'm a sophomore studying computer science, and my question is uh, regarding like the startup opportunities in Japan. So, in a lot of emerging markets like India and China. Um, I think a lot of startups are sort of taking existing business models in the U.S. and replicating them there. Do you think a similar kind of thing is going to happen in Japan, or is it going in a different direction where it's very specific to the Japanese market? Great question. So in a lot of uh, emerging markets, you have people who basically take a business model from here or somewhere else and implement them there with some localization and basically become, you know, the Uber of Southeast Asia or whatever. Do you see that happening in Japan or is Japan, are Japanese startups really kind of going independently? Well, it's, it's absolutely happens here. I, I, I think um, in any market, the vast majority of startups are kind of, uh, if not copycats, highly derivative. Um, I think that's true in the US too, though, as well. Most startups are not like bringing something really new and innovative to the market. It's, it's kind of derivative. 
So the bulk of the startups here are operating on a similar business model to companies you'd see in the U.S. There's a handful of th companies that are doing things that are very different. Uh, now, some of those might be responding to unique needs of the Japanese market, or some might be just radically different way of approaching a problem. And I know, uh, let's just uh, maybe like Mui Labs, for example. Um, they just have a different approach to user interface. Um, but yeah, most I'd say most are, most business models are very- not exactly cloned off of anything. No, no, exactly. Okay, okay. Thank you, right. Other questions? We have a question from Keishin, who is uh, curious about how to increase M&A as an exit option for startups. He points out that formerly startup companies, which are now SMEs, are uh, should be big acquisition targets. Do you think that the situation in Silicon Valley, where M&A is by far the most common kind of exit, uh, do you think that's going to happen in Japan? I think it it it's going to have to become much more common. I, I think the 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 health of the Japanese economy and the future of innovation here depends on Japanese enterprise getting much better at M&A. That said, I don't think that will, Japan will ever get to the stage of strategic M&A the way it exists in the US. So the, the idea of saying, okay, in six months, we want to enter this new market, make a list of the top three private companies in that market, and we're gonna buy one of them. Buy one, yeah. Yeah. I, don't think in my lifetime <laughs> I'll see uh, Japanese companies operating to that extreme. But I, I do think uh, getting M&A right is one of the most important things that, that Enterprise Japan has to figure out. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the classroom? If not, what I'd like to suggest is that we call an end to the formal program and keep going just in a much more informal kind of atmosphere for a few minutes more. Uh, first of all, Tim, thank you so much for sharing really well-informed perspectives from you know, an exceptional standpoint. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for inviting me, Richard. I, I really, um, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I really am.